Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim GK. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim J.K., your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having Byron Cage, a gospel artist, singer, composer. Uh, he's going to talk to us for the next uh, 30 or so minutes. And uh, if you'd like to call in, you can go ahead and put a question in the chat room. I'll go ahead and read it on the air, or you can call in at 347-324-3460. Or you can just email at info at Apple Capital Group, and I'll go ahead and take your question there. Well, Byron, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. I guess to begin with, uh, I was explaining before we went on the air, we like to hear stories, our audience. So kind of tell us about yourself, if you don't mind. Just take a moment, tell us how you got started, and go from there. Sure. I'm, I'm originally from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I always have to say that that's really where it started. I went to a very old <laughs> church called Bethel Pentecostal Church, and um, you know it was a cutting-edge church back then where they were doing uh, theatrical productions and musicals with, with you know with incredible sets and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, my dad was a singer, my mom was a singer, plays the piano, and and I kind of got it innocently. I grew up in a church where the famous family DeBarge came out of. We all grew up together, so there was so much music that was around me. So when we moved to Detroit, I was 13, and um, then the, uh, the late Reverend Donald Vales was my minister of music. Fred Hammond was the bass guitar player at the time. I was the organist, and I played wow. piano and directed the choir. So it was all kind of like you know building a whole storyline of where the Lord has allowed me to be today. And uh, it was a little later on when I was um, like 20 where I began singing background for the late minister Thomas Whitfield, and uh, then I started doing plays. It was a playwright by the name of Michael Matthews. I was in his very first play called Wicked Ways, and uh, mm-hmm. from there, of course, I had the opportunity to work with people like Rance Allen and Karen Clark Sheard, and, you know, just I started getting around the whole musical circle in Detroit and started, you know, making a name for myself as a writer and as an actor and as a singer and musician, and so it really started there, and then, um, wow, then I moved to um, Atlanta, Georgia, got a scholarship to go to Morehouse College uh, to do music, and um, thank God from there I met a gentleman by the name of Reverend Eddie Long at the time, when New Birth only had 300 members, and then, of course, you know, 10 years after after I left after that, uh, there was well over 20,000. And um, just from that, wow. it opened so many doors and ideas for me to record with different people I commissioned and things like that. And uh, then I recorded my first solo project in 1994 called Dwell Among Us. And then I followed that one up on Air Gospel with a, 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 a record called Transparent in Your Presence. And then uh, there was seven years that um, I didn't record a solo project, but I still was doing uh, music for the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, where I served as their general overseer for music and praise and worship leader. And, um, you know, Vicki McLaughlin out at the time, she saw a song that I did with the, uh, the, the fellowship called Shabbat. And she really mm-hmm. liked it, especially the part where we had uh, the Kara dancing bishops and everybody was dancing, having a great time. So she wanted to record that. She recorded that song, the full gospel, and that became a big song on that record. So she asked me to submit another song for the next record, and I did. It was called Yet Praise Him, and that was uh, also the same record that Bow Down and Worship Him was on. And uh, from that, she offered me a deal, a record deal and a publishing deal. And uh, and then she uh, put me with the likes of Kirk Carr, who wrote The Presence of the Lord is Here for Me. And then it just Go, it just went from there. Uh, the roller coaster ride of God's favor and His blessings have certainly been there in my life. And so now, you know, we now here on my ninth CD called Memoirs of a Worshipper. Um, you know, I, I went back and got my homeboy Fred on this one, as well as um, Aaron Lindsay, of course, is an incredible. Uh, Grammy Award when he produced a stellar award when he produced her and uh, it's just been a wonderful journey um, but I, I think that's kind of it the short end of it I, I could talk about it for about an hour but uh, I would just want to give you the short version today <laughs> I guess let's go back um, uh, 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 all the way to the past and when you was uh, in your childhood years when did, did you start learning a musical instrument I know you I, mentioned that your parents actually was musically inclined with, but when you started, what did you start with? 
I first started playing the saxophone, um, actually, in elementary school. I played the baritone saxophone that was actually taller than me. They would have to place it upright on a, a stand, and, and they would lean it back to me, and I learned how to play the baritone saxophone first. And then I moved to the alto saxophone, but I had a problem um, biting down on the mouthpiece. The irritation used to irritate my teeth. It was like a chalk on, on a chalkboard, so I would play with my lips closed. And the teeth ended up cutting the inside of my mouth, so I couldn't uh, play the saxophone anymore. My mom just heard me playing at a piano one time, and she said, you know, son, I think you have a touch for the piano. So when I was 15 years old, she bought me a, um acrosonic upright piano for $100 and placed it in the house, and, and I just started banging away. And uh, then, of course, I got a scholarship and learned music, how to play by music. But it was um, a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, start. I love the saxophone, but I'm grateful that my mom saw the special talent of, of music in me, and she uh, cultivated that. So how do you write your music? Do you Does it come to you all at one time, uh, or do you go in the middle of the night, or this idea come to you, and from this idea you start putting a whole piece together, or just a whole song comes to you? You know, my worship stuff, especially the real heartfelt stuff, uh, most of the time those come like three thirty, four 4 o'clock in the morning when I'm up worshiping and praying and, wow. and just having my devotion with God. Um, that, that's why some of my lyrics that people say when they tweet me, they're like, wow, um, someone tweeted me today said, gratitude is the song from my heart to God. Um, because those kind of songs are those songs that are birthed in my personal time with the Lord. And then songs that are usually up-tempo and praise in nature um, are the ones you Usually that, you know, I, I might be sitting at home and I might come up with a groove and then, you know, be studying the word and say, oh, this song, this scripture might be a great song. How would I put the scripture into music? And uh, so it just kind of comes in various ways. But my, my more heartfelt songs like Gratitude and You, Special Place, mm-hmm. um, any of those songs are always songs that are birthed out of my devotion time. Tell us about devotion. How is it important for an artist or just a person in their lives how can you know everything is so busy how how important the devotion is oh it's it's extremely important because there's so many talented people out there there's so many singers who sing even way better than me but they don't necessarily have the opportunities or the favor that i have because i've tapped into a successful type of life where you um, spend so much time with the Lord. Uh, usually there's time when people are sleeping, like when I was up this morning around 4, uh, praying to the Lord and just worshiping. Um, God gives you things. He births things in your spirit. And I think that he knows that he can trust you and, and that you are not relying just on your gifting or your talent alone, uh, but you're relying on him. And, um, you know, I, I worship the Lord like I take a shower every day. It's something that I do every day. I have a lifestyle of a worshiper. And I think that when you have that, your music resonates to people and they can feel the spirit and the anointing of God coming through the music and it, it's not necessarily something that's uh, ear candy if I can say that it's something that's heart changing life changing and it just moves you right into the presence of the Lord well you know a lot of people are just really really distracted here especially here in America we have so many noises family life everything in general that is just really distracting us so the best time you say for that devotional period is to do it when it's the quietest, which is like a four day or five day in the morning. Uh, for for me personally, that's my mm-hmm. life. I'm not saying that that's the formula for everyone, but spending time with God is the formula for success because He did it with Adam. That's what He required. Uh, the Bible said that He would walk with Adam in the cool of the garden in Genesis because uh, God wanted fellowship with man. He wanted fellowship with His creation, and that's what He wants with us. He wants fellowship more than our service. He wants our worship. We are to serve the Lord with gladness, but we're also to come before His presence with singing and to worship Him and to bless Him. Wow. And within your devotional period, do you have like, how do you begin that? Do you have like some reading materials or you just put yourself in like a meditative state or how is it that for you that you can share with people so they can, we talk about it, but some people say, okay, what do I actually do? Does well, let me tell you, the first thing that you can do that would be a tremendous blessing okay. now, is if you have an iPod, uh, iPad or if you have some sort of uh, a tablet where you can tap into the Internet, there are Internet Bibles out there that are audio. And a lot of times what I like to do is I like to pull up the Scripture and let the Scripture read to me, let the person that's the voice of the Bible, and and just read Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And then, you know, I meditate on the word that I've heard. I pray to God, 
And, um, you know, sometimes I'm sporadic. I'll just go into the Psalms because I want to be in, in, in a mode of, of David. I want to hear what he went through. And, you know, though he was an imperfect person, God still said that he was a man after God's own heart. So I want those scriptures creating me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. And, you know, once I hear the scriptures, then I just pray to God, you know. And, and I don't pray to him, you know, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, I speak in real talking to him, you know. And, and then I, I conversation. Just, Absolutely. And, and it, it always starts out with worship and reverence of how appreciative I am that he loves me so, and he hasn't changed his mind. Even if I've fallen short, he's still there to love me and to bring me back into a right place, and to be, into a wealthy place. And I think that's what I've learned. Then after I finish praying, um, you know, I'll worship him, sing a little song that, you know, it's just a song of the Lord, nothing that I've necessarily written down. Um, but then when I do get together for my records, when I'm trying to prepare for my records, I am intentional in my worship, too. I want the music that God wants uh, his people to hear in this next season uh, for what he's calling me to do. Okay. You talked about, I think, one of your interviews regarding spirit and truth. Mm-hmm. And we hear that all the time. How do you worship in spirit and truth? Or what the meaning well, of the spirit and truth? But the Bible says that God is spirit and those who worship him in his divine nature. And if you don't understand his divine nature of who he is and the wealth and the worship of a God that we serve, you can't worship him. Anybody can praise the Bible said, let everything that, that have breath praise the Lord. Anybody can say that. You know, that's why you see the, the different award shows. I say this all the time and you know, you see secular artists getting up there doing everything contrary to spirituality and God. But when they win the first thing they want to thank is well, I want to praise God, you know, for the and it's amazing, you know. But worship is something because if you worship you have to worship him in his divine nature, which is spirit, and you all have to worship in truth, which is his word. And that's what separates um, uh, people in the world who just praise God and those people who worship him because they understand his divine nature, his promises, and everything that he said according to his truth, which is his word. Okay. And then when we talk about praise and worship, what is praise and what is worship? Well, the misconception is that praise is a fast song and worship is a slow song, and it's not. Mm -hmm. They're just different postures or different places to be. Um, And a lot of people like to to praise, but not everybody likes to take the time to really go beyond the veil. It's kind of like it was in the old dispensation of praise and worship in the Old Testament, where they had to go to the outer court, the inner court, and the most holy place where the presence of the Lord is. But everybody could Mm -hmm. not go into the most holy place. Only the high priest could go, and there would have to be animals sacrificed in the outer courts, and the singers would have to be in the outer courts, and the elders could go into the inner courts where they would have to keep to their divisions, but only the the high priest could go into the most holy place and get the word of God. But when Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice by giving his life, in Matthew 27, the Bible says that there was a split in the most holy place of the veil, giving immediate access to worshipers to go into his presence. And um, worship is simply reverencing and honoring and blessing and having the type of lifestyle of worship with God that you can go into his presence at any time glorifying him. A lot of times we praise because we're trying to get everybody's mindset and their focus on a vertical experience as opposed to a horizontal. And I think that's what most people in praise a lot of times don't understand why I can't really get into that place, that most holy place of worship is because it takes time for you to really uh, understand the discipline of your life, the discipline of the word, the discipline of worship, and uh, once you learn those elements, you can go right into his presence easier. Well, uh, we're going to take a caller, uh, Erica, 281, uh, in a few seconds. But just to wrap out this section regarding praise and worship, when they're talking about ministry and performing, a question always come up, how can you discern which is which? Well, we know that there is a entertainment value to the gospel music, just like it is to the CCM side. You know, whenever you use like the, the big lights and and the echoes and the fog and the smoke machines and all that kind of stuff, that adds value to the entertainment of what we do. But true ministry, of course, you always feel and you sense uh, those who you know are born of the Spirit can always discern the anointing and the difference between a performance and an actual ministering moment. And ministry usually always does come in, especially during worship songs. Like my new single, Great and Mighty, is a strong, strong worship song. But then there's a song on my CD called Troubles Away. 
and that's got this almost 1950s, uh, early 60s Frankie Lyman kind of sound, where it does. It has a more entertaining value because it tickles the ear, it makes you jump and feel good. Not saying that that's not ministry, but I just think that when we do the songs that are vertical, they really do take us more into a place of God's anointing. Okay. And when do you know when it's ministry? Well, you know, for me, I do realize I have a number of songs. Some of my songs, like Shabbat, where people, uh, when we get to the Kara part where we're dancing, I still think that it's ministry, but there's still a level of entertainment that people enjoy to be able to jump and to shout and all that good stuff. Uh, and there is a line, there's a fine line of ministry, but I think it's each individual minister's place that they understand. You know, I can't define anybody else's time when they're entertaining and when they're ministering. I can only define what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking, and I find my more ministry side, most parts will be for my ballads and my worship songs. Wow, that's awesome. We're going to take a call at Erico 281. Erico 281, you're on the air. Thank you for calling. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I just want to say I am a very big fan of Byron Cage. And what my question is about the gift. Yolanda Adams said on the BET Awards during her acceptance speech, use your gift responsibly. If I know Byron did not say that, but if he can expound more upon that, that would be great. Yes, yeah, very, very nice to meet thank you. Thank you for calling. Yeah, I, I think Yolanda, of course, is a great legend, you know, in gospel music. And when she says, use your gift wisely, because I did not see the award show itself, but I know her heart and I know her, I think that she has had so much success in understanding that gifts and callings come without repentance, but it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost that is going to destroy the yoke. So when you use your gift responsibly, I think she's just speaking, especially for in the BT Awards, they have R&B artists and the gospel artists together. So I'm sure she's just probably uh, just sharing with everybody to make sure that your gift, that you don't abuse it, that you don't use it to hurt or harm other people or harm uh, generations of people or ethnicities, but that you use it responsibly and that you don't do something to tear people down. Because I know there's always the, the wars between the East Coast and the West Coast rappers, and, yeah, this rapper has a problem with this R&B singer. And uh, we've all have been given a gift by God. But any gift that is not converted to God has the potential to be perverted by the world every single time and their systems. So, yeah, I agree with Yolanda. Any gift that we have, we have to use it responsibly. We're going to take a break real quick, and we're going to talk about, it's kind of ironic that I remember you mentioned that you worked with Thomas Whitfield, and I remember her first album was produced by Thomas Whitfield yes. in, in mm-hmm. 87. So, anyway, we're going to take a break real quick, and we'll be back in a moment with Byron Cage. Listen to The Core Business Show. I'm Tim J.K., your host. You're listening to The Core Business Show. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to the core. Once again, here's Tim Japan. Well, we are back with Byron Cage again. Uh, we're uh, doing the interview with him. Let's talk about Thomas Whitfield, because ironically, Thomas Whitfield. Do you think Thomas Whitfield was before his time? Because he took gospel music in a different direction. I know you have key points of different musicians that kind of influence the style. And even his style is timely today that you still hear that sound today. Tell us, was it unique in working with him and about his style? And it was his style, I know he was a transcendent, but was it before his time? Well, I'll say this. He was in his time and before his time because a lot of the music that he did, he still 
was able to capture the church sound. But what he did is his chord structures and the way he blended his choir and his groups on his albums were very, very cutting edge, and it caused the, uh, the bar to be raised pretty much as Kim Burrell did for singing. When Kim Burrell came along, of course, before her, we had the great likes of Daryl Coley and Karen Clark Sheard. But when Kim came along, she raised the bar because she had such a unique voice and was very, very different. I said the same thing about Tommy. Tommy was out during the same time, Donald Vales, Reverend James Cleveland, the Hawkins singers, um, um, Audrey Crouch. He had so many things, but he stood out because he had something different, and I think that's what um, I brought to the table when I came out. I brought something different, you know, in praise and worship where it wasn't necessarily uh, uh, a, a popular genre of music on the gospel side, especially. And that's what I think the Lord blessed him because he did come out and he was so different. And uh, boy, I can only imagine if he was still alive today, you know, what he would have done because on June 24th, we celebrated his life. He has been gone now for 20 years. It's hard to believe. Years. Yeah, and it, it's just something to think that what he would have been today had he still been alive. Wow, I remember that, the summer of that time in uh, 1992. Ironically, when you walk in the studio of Berklee College of Music in Boston, the young musicians, out of all the people they're going to try to learn how to play like, they always gravitate to his chord progression. Mock is one, Thomas Whitfield is second. Mm -hmm. It's kind of ironic when you walk in there and that's what you hear. And some of the musicians are only 18 years old. They don't know, but that's who they gravitate towards. And ironically, they picked up his style as the norm for them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there was a young man, I think his name was Philip Feaster, um, played for me when I was in Boston. He went to, to the college there, and he had never played for me before, but I knew that he played for Fred. And I was like, wow, this guy can really, really play. And so there were other students that were at the concert as well, and they were just sharing how much they appreciate, you know, the production of Aaron Lindsay on my records because he just raises the bar every single time. And it challenges them not only because they read music very well, first of all, but it challenges them in their improvisational skills to be able to do different things. And I think Tommy was one of the fathers of that, that sound of that quick scale run that he could do in those chord progressions that he would do. And he will live forever. His music is legendary. It was good 20 years ago. It's still good today. Good good today. You're talking about the, the gift itself, the gift and what can be taught. Some people naturally have this particular gift in playing a certain way. Some people have to be taught a certain way to get there. Why is that, in your opinion, that this person is gifted in one sense and just hears it naturally and go for it, this other person has to learn it. Well, you know, it's just a natural uh, gift that God gives people. Um, there are some individuals who can sit down and play something right after they've heard it and they play it by ear. There are other individuals who may have to listen to it a month before they can even play the first part of the song. I just think it's just the different giftings that God gives us. And we all have different gifts. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Top of the Hour also regarding favor. Tell us about what is favor uh, for the people who don't know, and why some people have favor and some people that excels them beyond natural reality and some don't. Well, you know, I believe that favor, I like the, the way Bishop Jake says, favor ain't fair, and I added to it, favor ain't fair, but it's fun, because it is really a lot of fun, um, a lot of times to be able to do um, what I do, and um, everybody's just not called uh, to walk at certain levels. I believe that God knows those individuals who has who he has anointed and has found favor to allow them to go forth in ministry, like I've been in ministry now full-time, this year marks 25 years full-time that I've been in ministry, and um, I haven't had to work a corporate job uh, on the outside. You know, my whole life is sustained in ministry. And uh, that's favor. That's the favor of God. And why did he favor me and maybe didn't favor uh, Brother Cucumber on the other end? I don't know. I don't know why God does the way he does. All I know is my pattern of success I've found because I've been faithful in serving and doing what God has called me, especially in the local church, even as I still serve as minister of music of churches uh, here in D.C. and a church also in uh, Richmond, Virginia. That's favor. People say, Byron, how can you be minister of music of two mega churches? Two churches. Favor. 
it's the favor of God. And, you know, I, I went to churches uh, here in one church here, should I say, in Fort Washington twice a month, and then I'm at the church in Richmond twice a month. And then I do my rehearsals on Mondays in D.C. I do my rehearsals on Wednesdays in Richmond. And, of course, the Lord financially has blessed me because of that. But um, even more so than that, I think the favor that God gives me um, is because it's a result of the time that I've spent uh, in doing what I do and uh, the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the power of the, the men and women of God especially trust the Spirit in me to know uh, what type of music I am to bring to the uh, various ministries. When you talk about as a person who's been in ministry, what advice do you have for a music minister who's trying to, some of them are really, really successful, some of them are at the beginning stages and some are in the middle who try to make it to that next level. What advice do you have for them First of all, when they in those three stages, number one, and then number two, what advice do you give them on how to minister to their people? And we're going to well, take a caller after that question at uh, Erica 317. Go ahead. Okay. I would just say, first of all, don't despise small beginnings. As you're first starting out, you know, learn how to really get in there and learn everything you possibly can about your craft and what you do. And integrity is so important. Honesty will follow you a long way. And if you love God's people and, and perfect your gift, as you go to that second level, the level now you are the person and you're the choir director and you're seeking to go to even the next level, which could be, you know, recording artist or, you know, some sort of a ministry of music over a large conference. There are all avenues by which God can use your gift and your talent. But I'm learning the formula to the success is to be faithful in the few and to allow the Lord to make you the ruler over many. Don't try to elevate yourself, because if you elevate yourself or if you let people elevate you, those are the same people that can bring you back down. But when God brings you to a wealthy place and he places you there, he will also place you there for influence, where you'll have influence on people, and then he will open up doors for provision for your life. That will change your life, uh, just as he's done for me. Wow. Okay, we're going to take a call real quick, and then I'm probably going to have a uh, question regarding how people, when they get to a certain level, then they, how can they avoid to be brought down? So we'll take that after we take this question at three, Erica 317. Erica 317, you're on the air. Thank you for calling. Hey, how's it going? Great. Good. Hey, yeah, your I'm question? I'm just listening in. Um, okay. Are y'all talking, talking about business, really? Or business, uh, the Ministry of Business, pretty much. Okay. Because I'm, I'm trying to start my business, but I'm not a, I don't really know about the tax side of it. Okay. So if you hold on, I can go in it. details with you at, uh, once we finish this episode. Okay. Okay, great. Talking about, you know, one piece of advice that George Bush offered, said to Barack Obama when he went to the office, and he said the first thing, people are going to be gunning for you. Is It comes with a job. The way he said it, that that's the first thing he left. I mean, that's the last thing he left with him. He said, everybody's going to be gunning for you because of who you are. And not saying because he's an African-American the president. It's because he has that title and position. And you find yourself within ministry that, if you're following me, that you bring yourself to the biggest, to the whatever. For example, you're talking about Jim Baker and so forth. You get this high, then all of a sudden everybody is going to attack you. How can you avoid that type of thing in ministry that people, you know that it's going to be constant attack, you just can't be in this world that things are just going to be, oh, my gosh, all wonderful. How can you avoid that? Well, unfortunately, you can't, you know, especially in the world that we live in with the social media network. Um, people can uh, make up blogs. They're, they made up blogs about me. Um, someone said that, you know, Bishop Eddie Long and I were involved, and that is 100% a lie. Never has he even ever approached me in that way. And um, they say all kinds of stuff about people, but unfortunately, you know, because we are public people and we are on TV and we are on the radio and we are on the Internet and print media, you know, impacting the world, People, they make these blogs, they go on anonymously and make statements about public people, which I always say is very cowardly. But unfortunately, you know, my mother always said that you never have to worry about a lie. 
you know, God will never believe a lie. And so I just try to live my life and govern my life according to the scriptures and, and walk in, uh, in integrity and do those things that God has called my hand to do. And whatever haters out there, haters you will have with you always. I do realize there are a lot of people that would love to be in my position, you know. Uh, even when I won the Stellar Award the last time, uh, last year for Mel Vocus of the Year, there were those who hated and said, how did he beat Marvin Sapp? How did he beat Fred Hammond and Jay Moss, you know? Well, because that's God's favorite. And, you know, people, they always want to diminish and discount, you know, your contribution to what it is that God has called you to do. But I look at it and say, I just pray for haters. Thank you. Keep on hating. It made me pray harder. And because I prayed harder, God gave me a song that the world is going to sing. So thank you for hating on me, you know. And I just don't, I don't worry about haters. I just worry about what God has called me to do. And I try to love everybody. Absolutely. You know, people in you know, large congregations of 3,000 or even 1,000, they're still going to go for you. I mean, they you know, they can be your biggest supporters, but you'll always have that dissension among that someone is just going to hate you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you just have to be in constant prayer that you praying for, not only you praying for yourself and your community, but you're also you praying for the haters at the same time. Oh, absolutely, because one of the greatest deliverances that I received several years ago is deliverance of people's perception and their opinions about me. You know, God created me uniquely. He made me who I am, and so I walk in his way and do what he's called me to do. And uh, whoever the haters are, God bless you all. You know what I'm saying? And you know, keep keep talking while you go in the store. You see my music. You turn on the radio. You hear me. You turn on television. I'm not going nowhere. So, you know, God bless you anyway. Love you, you know. And everybody <laughs> has their right to, you know, I guess feel the way they want to feel about it. An individual's music. But I think what you do is you miss out on potentially the spirit of the Lord being able to minister to you through my music. And uh, But, you know, some people get it you know, one way, and praise God. As long as they get to Jesus, that's the most important thing. Great. When it's talking about the gospel music industry itself, tell us about the gospel music industry, because within the last 30 years, we have really, really advanced to different realms altogether. I remember praise and worship used to be that music that Anglos do. And all of a sudden, within, and I just remember growing up in Houston and Lakewood, oh, that's pretty. Now, give thanks. And slowly, that migration moved in, finally into the African American church. Tell us about the last 30 years, in your opinion, as being a music director, a minister of music in the last 30 years. How things really changed? Well, you know, I think the methods have changed because, you know, you have new instrumentations now. You have new auto-tunes and things that we didn't have back uh, 25 years ago when I started professionally as a minister of music. You know, you had the Mississippi Mass Choir and the Thompson Community Choir and Thomas Whitfield Company and Donald Vales and James Cleveland and Keith Pringle. You had all these great choirs that were out with the choir sound. And through the years... You know, things begin to change, and I think that West Angeles Church of God in Christ, along with Patrick Henderson and uh, Judy Christie McAllister, then you had Carlton Pearson and Gary Oliver, and they were starting the whole, I think, cross-culture of praise and worship for the African-American church. And then, of course, the Lord allowed me to come and do the song in 1996, I think it was, with Full Gospel Baptist doing Shabbat, where there weren't praise teams in the Baptist church at first. And then when I came and introduced it to Full Gospel as their minister of praise and worship, the next year everybody was Shabbatking with praise teams. And so I think that though the methods, again, have changed, the message of the gospel remains the same. We may now uh, play more acoustic guitar sound, like, you know, Great and Mighty has that strong, almost rock guitar, to where we wouldn't have done that maybe 15 or 20 years ago, uh, because it would have been looked upon as being on the CCM side. But now I think we'll cross... Uh, crossing our genres because now I see a lot of the um, the Anglo churches doing the the big praise shout songs where they're shouting in the floor and dancing. I turned on YouTube and, and saw uh, one of their choirs singing "I Can't Hold It" and they didn't hold it. And I said, it's funny how we're crossing each other's uh, music and uh, it's blessing uh, ministries all over the world. So I applaud it. I love change because I think that there's nothing wrong with it as long as we make sure that our message is clear and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Wow. If you talk about praise and worship teams and the role, uh, you know, there was some confusion about what is the role of a praise team, what's the role of a choir, what's the role of a song leader. If you don't mind, can you tell us for our general public, 
in this new modern age now, what is the role for the I mean the song leader, the praise team, and the uh, the choir? Since that's the direction a lot of churches are going towards. Well, I, I believe that there are some churches obviously lean stronger to choirs than now some churches lean stronger to praise teams because I think, you know, what choir directors have uh, been under the microscope to try to do each time, I think, for the congregation is to bring them to this point of, of this high praise where everybody's shouting having a good time. And if they did not do that, then, you know, sometimes the director feels uh, like potentially I could have failed this week and didn't do what I was supposed to do. When in actuality, if we just yield our gifts and our talents to the Lord, His anointing is going to destroy the yokes where we can take the pressure off of ourselves to entertain people. Uh, what we need to do is just be obedient to Him, spend time with Him, know what songs to sing at the right time, and uh, allow His Spirit and His power to do what it's going to do. Uh, we're not God. We are His people, but we're not Him. We can't bless the people from the standpoint of you know hearing every single prayer and being every place at the same time as God is, but he can. So uh, that's what I would say. As far as a praise team leader, I would always keep them uh, to make sure they realize that praise and worship is about him, not about you. And when you understand that, you know, um, the songs that you sing, that you choose, will all be vertical to praise him and to glorify him. You won't be trying to sing solos and have everybody listening to you, because that really is a solo that's not praise and worship. So that's why we choose songs that the congregation can sing uh, to the Lord, and we usually put them up on screen so they'll remain excellent. So I think that when we have all the components, especially with the instruments together, uh, we'll find that we'll have powerful, uh, anointed uh, service, whether it's through the choir or whether it's through praise and worship. Wow. What advice do you have to strike a balance as a music director in the congregation? Say, these things have worked for me. How can you build an awesome choir, musicians, awesome music ministry? What I've learned to do is to go out and see what other people are doing as well. Come out of the four walls. I know that you guys have mastered the sound and what you do in your house, but a lot of times it's great to go and find other ministries and see different ideas that they're doing that you could come back and not copycat, but just enrich your experience with your church by adding on some new concepts and some new things that uh, would be a tremendous blessing, like uh, liturgical dancers within the service. Uh, those type of things add weight and value to a service. And um, I think that if you, you get out and see what other ministries are doing, that you'd be pleasantly surprised that you could even take your department to another level. Wow. When it comes to regarding you dropping the Prince of Praise, what's the reason why that you dropped the Prince of Praise? I know you mentioned it in several interviews, but yeah, just I, a clarification. I, 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 yeah, I, I took that off my name because I didn't want anybody to think I was trying to exalt myself above to be anything. As a matter of fact, there was a publication leader who put in her magazine that I was the self-proclaimed Prince of Praise. No, I was not the self-proclaimed. That was said through the introduction on the Presence of the Lord is Here album. My co-pastor who does the introduction, she said, and he's the Prince of Praise and Worship. Let's receive him now, Minister Byron Cage. Well, Vicki McLaughlin, I'd love that. She said that's what everybody knows him for, Praise and Worship. So He's a prince of praise, and that's how we're gonna we're gonna brand him. So as they begin to brand that, you know, some people begin to be offended and, and thinking that I was trying to be the prince of. And so, you know, Dr. Helena Barrington, who I have the utmost respect for in Tallahassee, Florida, she called me and she said, she said, son, I caution you, please don't let them call you that. She said because she said the enemy desires to sift you as wheat, and you don't want anything that's going to hinder the anointing of God in your ministry and in your life. So please, so. I said, yes, ma'am, thank you for telling me. I received it. And then I started publicly denouncing that title because I didn't want anybody to think I was trying to exalt myself uh, the way Lucifer did in the Old Testament when he said he would become like the Most High God uh, because he was the praise angel. And so, of course, we know the story. He was cast out of heaven and he was turned into uh, Satan. And uh, and so now I did not want to have anything even remotely close to that happening to me. So that's kind of why I dropped it. I just tell people to call me Byron. I know they still call me Prince of Praise a lot of places, <laughs> but I still denounce it every time they say it. <laughs> well, tell us about your, your style uh, of your music. 
Well, I, I think when you listen to my style, um, though it's praise and worship, it can be praise and worship um, very traditional, or it can be very praise and worship uh, contemporary. Um, even on this new CD, I have songs, uh, like I wrote a song called My Refuge, My Strength, which is a, a straight-up buck, grab the pew and go for it kind of song. And then I wrote a song called You, which is the total opposite. It's a worship, beautiful, almost sounds like something the Beatles would have sang. Um, so I just think that the wide variety of the wide range of music that I have, that anybody that picks up the CD, they should be able to find something that they can grab a hold to and say, I love this song. I didn't expect you to seem so... Well, tell us about this latest project. Um, Memoirs of a Worshipper, of course, in stores now, everywhere. You can even buy it on, on the Internet, at Amazon, Walmart, Best Buy, iTunes, wherever you buy gospel music. But I wanted to write this particular album, and I called it Memoirs of a Worshipper because the last CD that I did, Faithful to Believe, was about God's people's faith being built up again because we were going through recession and through hard times financially. And so that's what Faithful to Believe was about. But now this album is vertical in nature. This is all worship, glorifying God, giving Him praise, and the listener to walk away with the sense of feeling of being closer to God than they ever have been. Uh, because when you listen to songs like Gratitude, Great and Might, Mighty, mighty God, you, um, when you listen to songs like that, they get into your spirit, and I believe and I pray what resonates in their heart is uh, the desire to be closer to God and that uh, they want the things of God, not necessarily the things of the world. And I, I pray that that's what my music is doing for them. Wow. And wait, let's backtrack real quick. When you came up on this particular project, how does this project compare to your other projects in the past? Well, I'm thankful that each project grows. It, there's growth. I pray that every time somebody hears my next record, they're like, wow, I love Faithful to Believe, but goodness gracious, his ministry of music on worship on this album is just a whole other level. And I think that there is a way to capture that, uh, but you have to be sensitive and you have to pay attention to the time of what's happening musically, you know, what's the hottest instruments now, what are the sounds um, that are going on now, because you don't want to get to a point where you become dated and your music starts all sounding alike. And I think that that's what I've been able to capture with Aaron Lindsay, my producer, uh, on these last two records specifically. When you talk about the presence of the Lord, now we bless the Lord. Kind of tell us the story behind those two particular well-known pieces. Well, the presence of the Lord here was written by Kirk Carr. And um, when we were talking about the record, he said, hey, Byron, I got a song I wrote. And we were in the studio. He said, I want you to hear this. And he began to sing, the presence of the Lord is here. I said, oh, that's hot, man. I like that. And he said, yeah, we're going to build it up until I'm going to get my blessing right now. So I said, okay. And so that's kind of how that came about. And when I record that night, I said to them, before I sang it, I said, I believe that this song is going to be ministered all over the world. It's a big song of praise and worship. And, and when we did it, of course, it went very, very well. And prophetically, I praise God, that song did exactly what I said that night that it was going to do. And I have the opportunity to travel with Benny Hinn all over the world singing that song in Australia, South Africa, uh, just, just everywhere. And, you know, I've been to Japan and it just, after, throughout South Africa, everywhere just going singing that song in particular has been the staple, I think, hit of all of my songs uh, through all of my records. And then I'll Bless the Lord is a song that I heard here from a local artist, and uh, his original lyrics for his verse, um, because I'm a lyricist, I love words, and they have to make sense to me. And his original verses were, you don't have to praise for me, I know what he's done for me. But because I'm a word person, I said I told him I wanted to change his verses. So um, I wrote, Magnify the Lord with me, whom the Son he hath redeemed. Clap your hands, rejoice to sing, for you are Lord of everything. And then I said, For the Lord our God is great, perfect Lord in all your way, God of mercy, Lord of grace, Holy One, ancient of days. Because I'm the type of person that uh, if you're going to talk about God, if you're going to say something, you know, if all I can say about him is he, you know, made a way out of no way, okay, that's fine. But if there's another way to say it, I always look for what that way is going to be. And so, of course, that song became the song of the year as well. And uh, it has just been a blessing. Those two songs in particular are still two of the most popular songs uh, when I do my concerts. Okay. What advice do you have for a person who's going coming up through the music industry? What things they need to take a look at business-wise as they sign a contract? What things they need to look at for an agent, for a publicist, and so forth? Yeah, that's a great question because a lot of times I think these the new artists especially are just excited to hear their songs on the radio, not realizing that there are transactions being made business-wise every time your song is played on the radio through publishing. 
and you know contracts of course with record companies buying people and their lives to years of contractual I, things by which people own the image the right to your image and to your likeness and of course attorneys are always advise to attain an attorney so they can tell you what the contract says exactly, how many records they're expecting you to do, um, what your rates are to recoup. And um, if there is a whole business side uh, that I always admonish people to, to especially starting out, to make sure that you know. Uh, there's a book called This Business of Music. I can't remember the author's name, but it just talks about the very thing. If you want to become an artist, it tells you how to do it and make sure your copyright laws and everything that you, if you're a writer that you understand publishing and uh, how that happens in them there is absolutely a business side to what we do it's ministry but there's also a business to it okay was that the book from i think the 70s or 80s by Sidney Sheldon I attorney out of New York uh-huh oh, okay yeah is it uh, i wonder if it's still in print but it's the business of music i remember that i might just post it on, on the website uh-huh. so i remember talking to you many many years ago in the 80s to sandra club when she uh just came out of the her waiting album the second one we completely yes and we were talking about points and she was saying well tim five and six points is no money what the person need to be looking for as important, and if you can tell us what points are and why they call I mean um no why they call points it's just percentages anyway, what the person need to be looking for when it comes to hey one, two, three, these are the points to expect these are the things that you need to avoid not to give away, and how to find an entertainment a lawyer does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that as, as it pertains, first of all, to the point center and all that kind of the percentages, um, a lot of times as a new artist especially, um, you're going to really get the bare minimum unless you're coming to the table already with such a following and, a, and proof of a following that you could potentially um, make a lot of money for a record label. Then you could negotiate just a little bit more. But it really is different with everybody. And most people, when you first are starting out, I tell them to really pay more attention, especially to publishing as a writer, because that's where you're going to receive a lot of your money from, will be from being okay. a writer and starting your own publishing company. Like my publishing company is called Nori BLLC, and I've had it for over 20 years. And I started writing for other people first. And then, of course, once I signed my first record deal, I already had a publishing company, so all of my music was published through my company. And then I got a major publishing deal with Lily Mac Music. And then, of course, she gave me $25,000 to sign as a publishing uh, person for her. And then Gospel Central, of course, I became an artist. And then we started talking about the point system and things like that. So um, it really is just different. You just have to really know what you're asking. You have to know what you're bringing to the table. If you're new, you're not going to be able to demand as much. You know, if you're seasoned, and if you're, and I'm just throwing this name out. If you're, of course, if a Donald Lawrence wanted to leave one label because his contract was up, many people would go after Donald because he's worth, because of his worth, because of his catalog of the music that he's written and all of his production things that he's done. He's experienced, so of course he could go and ask for three or four points. You know, especially as a mm-hmm. producer on the record. So yeah, so it just varies. Okay. And again, when they're looking for an entertainment attorney, some of them run into problems because. You have to have a real entertainment attorney in order to handle an entertainment type transaction. That's all exactly right. And, and, and here again, one of the best ways to find that out, especially in your area, is the internet. I mean, the internet is a golden way to find out how to move forward in that area. Okay. Last two questions. When it comes to, I think you mentioned and in interviewed someone for the question here regarding the cookie congregation. What's the cookie congregation? Oh Lord, I've been off that cookie. I'm, I'm back on the regular Keebler cookies now. <laughs> <laughs> the, cook, the cooking congregation was something that I was doing to lose weight, and um, the uh, the company I'm not attached with them anymore. I, but I did lose 40 pounds, and I have been maintaining. Thank God, still trying to to get off these last pesky little 10 pounds. Um, but uh, it was it was a system that did work for me at the time. I don't know that they're in business anymore, as I haven't had an opportunity to speak with the owner who happens to owe me some money, but um, <laughs> I'm not part of the cookie congregation. I think that pastor, they voted him out, and uh, I don't think there's a cookie congregation anymore, though. Okay. Who do you listen to as an artist that influenced you in the past? Oh, besides the Winans and the Clark sisters and 
uh, Thomas Whitfield. I mean, I just love gospel music. Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Keith Pringle. I just listen to all kinds of uh, people in the gospel. Then, of course, I, I was a huge Jackson 5 fan. I love Jackson 5. And just different music that was positive that, that made me feel good. And so uh, those are some of my favorite stuff. Okay. And lastly, a song that really speaks to who you are and how you like to be remembered in 100 years from now. Uh, you. If, if people really, you know, once they get past all of the hype songs and the big songs on my record, when you sit down and listen to you um, and you really listen to the words, I, that's what I want for people to always remember and to always say, you know, you know, he was a worshiper. And that's because that's what was important to me, even more so than anything else, that they knew that I was a worshiper and, and that there is music in the earth, thank God, that we were able to uh, bring forth and that it be received in the way it has been. And that title is called You on your latest album or on another album? That's on the uh, the latest record. Okay, perfect. Well, Byron, thank you for, thank uh, you, sir. for coming on this program. Any last words you'd like to leave with, the, with people? Yeah, Tim, I just tell your listeners to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The Bible says, for as much as we know, our labor is not going to be in vain. Stay there on the wall, continue to be faithful, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Take care. Again, the Byron Wood interview with Byron Cage. We're going to take a break for a second, listen to one title track, and we will close out the program. Again, everybody, thank you for listening. I'm Tim J.K., your host. And we're going to listen to Great and Mighty by Byron Cage. And if we can find you, we're going to go ahead and play that one to you in the program. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.